Hello everyone, my name's Hannah White and I'm the Collections Assistant at Warrington Museum and Art Gallery. I'm going to be taking you through today's session which is looking at women in art. It is likely to be of no surprise to many of you that women are generally underrepresented in art. This fact is sadly true of the collections at Warrington Museum and Art Gallery. Not that women are not chosen as a subject of artists, but more so that there are few artworks by female artists in the collections. Studies around the world suggest that only 3-5% to of permanent collections in the USA and Europe are by women artists. There's not one real reason for this imbalance. Historically, women were not allowed the same opportunities as men, such as going to art school or painting from life models, both of which were often key to an artist's training. So today, in celebration of this year's International Women's Day, I'd like to take you on a short tour of some of the wonderful women featured in the collections at Warrington Museum and Art Gallery. We will begin our tour not in Warrington Museum, but instead in the entranceway to Warrington Central Library. Those of you who are familiar with the Museum and Library building will know that the library is sited exactly beneath the museum. In the foyer of the Central Library, two of the museum's larger figurative sculptures are on display the first of which depicts Catherine Macaulay. Who is Catherine Macaulay, you may ask? Well, Catherine Macaulay, nee Sawbridge, was born in 1731 and was an English Whig Republican historian. Catherine was a daughter of John Sawbridge and, and wife Elizabeth, who was landed proprietor from Wye in Kent, and whose ancestors were Warwickshire yeomanry. Catherine was educated privately at home by governess and in her later writings claims that she was a prolific reader, particularly work relating to liberty. Aged 29 years, Catherine married a Scottish physician called Dr George Macaulay, and the married couple lived at St James's Place in London. The couple had one child called Catherine Sophia, but sadly they were only married for six years before George died. Between the years of 1763 and 1783, Macaulay wrote one of her best-known publications, totalling eight volumes, conveying a political history of the 17th century. It was titled The History of England from the Accession of James I to that of the Brunswick Line. However, as has been done by many authors in the past, Catherine reached the last three volumes to find that she was not going to make it to 1714, and so she altered the title to The History of England from the Accession of James I to the Revolution. Macaulay was associated with two political groups during the 1760s and 1770s, the Real Whigs and the Wilkites. Macaulay was a supporter of John Wilkes during the Wil Wilkesite controversy of the 1760s and associated with the Radical Society of the Supporters of the Bill of Rights, with both groups wanting to reform Parliament. On the publication of her work, Catherine went from being unknown to the celebrated Mrs Macaulay, virtually overnight. She was in fact the first English woman to become a historian and was very much someone who we would refer to today as a trailblazer. Macaulay's work became increasingly more radical and on the 14th of November 1778 she married William Graham, which owing to their large age difference damaged her reputation in Britain and particularly in Bath, the city where she lived. Some of the controversy is likely to have been driven by the fact that her new husband's younger brother was a inventor of the celestial bed. Her status as a woman writer with a damaged reputation has allowed her to be forgotten or disregarded by later historians of the 18th century literature and politics. However, she has received more attention recently for her significance as a writer and political thinker. Catherine Macaulay died in Binfield, Berkshire on the 22nd of June 1791, where she was buried in All Saints Parish Church. Warrington Museum and Art Gallery sculpture of Catherine Macaulay was produced by the artist John Francis Moore and it depicts her as history, a certain reference to her accomplishments as a historian. The next lady that we will look at is Rachel, a female figure from the Bible. Rachel was said to be the favourite of Jacob's two wives and she was the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. She is mentioned in the Hebrew Bible in Genesis 29 when Jacob meets her as she is about to water her father's flock. 
Jacob was Rachel's first cousin, and he had travelled a great distance to find Laban, her father, having been sent by Rebecca, her aunt, who had sent him there to be safe from his angry twin brother, Esu. However, whilst he was staying with Rachel, Jacob fell in love with her and agreed to work seven years for Laban in return for her hand in marriage. The course of true love never runs smoothly, they say, and on the night of their wedding, when the bride unveiled herself to Jacob, he did not notice that Leah, Rachel's oldest sister, had been substituted for Rachel. Warrington Museum and Art Gallery sculpture of Rachel stands in the entranceway to Warrington Central Library alongside that of Catherine Macaulay. It was produced by the well-known local sculptor John Warrington Wood, who favoured mythological and biblical subjects, and portrait busts as, as his muse. Born in Warrington, Lancashire in 1839, Wood trained as a stonemason, later moving to Rome in 1861, which became his main place of work. He adopted Warrington as his middle name to distinguish him from that of the older sculptor John Wood, who was born in 1801. Warrington Wood exhibited works at the Royal Academy from 1868 to 1874, and it is believed that some of the best examples of his work are within the collections at Warrington Museum and Art Gallery. In 1599, a young Roman noblewoman called Beatrice Sensi was condemned and beheaded for the murder of her father, Count Francesco Sensi. There is a well-known legend surrounding Beatrice Sensi because she was supposedly a victim of abuse at the hands of her father and thus resulting in her murdering him. This sculpture at Warrington Museum and Art Gallery was produced by local artist John Warrington Wood and it was commissioned in memory of the late John Crossfield of Crossfield Soapworks. It captures Beatrice seated holding a crucifix in her hand. There would also originally have been a revolving iron frame around the sculpture which is now missing. Born on the 6th of February in 1577, Beatrice Sensi was the daughter of Ursilia Santa Croix and Count Francesco Sensi. Upon the death of her mother when Beatrice was only seven years of age, she and her elder sister Antonina were sent to a small monastery, Santa Croce a Monte Cretorio, for Francescan tertiary nuns in the Colonna district of Rome. Beatrice's father, Count Sensi, was recorded as being a violent and dissolute man, and the family situation was certainly made worse by her mother's death. Beatrice is reputed to have murdered her father, and her punishment for this was delivered on the 11th of September 1599 at dawn, when Beatrice Sensi was beheaded. For the people of Rome, Beatrice is a symbol of resistance against the arrogant aristocracy. Every year, on the night before the anniversary of her death, a legend says that she comes back to the bridge where she was executed. The Roman goddess Diana is considered a patroness of the countryside, hunters, crossroads and the moon. In the sculpture at Warrington Museum and Art Gallery, Diana is depicted as a naked female figure with a half-moon crest on her brow, showing her other role as goddess of the moon. The myth of Diana has been the chosen subject matter for many artists, including painters such as Titian, Rubens, Boucher and Poussin. Most of the depictions featured show her resting after hunting. Warrington Museum and Art Gallery sculpture of Diana is usually on permanent display on the first floor landing where she is captured standing on a globe, representing the world, and appears to be just awakening. It may have been produced by the sculptor Andrea who was working in Florence during the 1860s, the period to which this sculpture can be dated. Diana is also considered a virgin goddess and protector of childbirth. Historically, Diana made up a triad with two other Roman deities, Ageria, the water nymph, her servant and assistant midwife, and Verbius, the woodland god. This bronze and ivory statuette of Guinevere in the collections at Warrington Museum and Art Gallery was created by the sculptor William Reynolds Stevens. It can be seen on permanent display in our Cabinet of Curiosities Gallery. There is a large amount of detail in the face of the statuette, created using ivory, silver and shell. The hands and feet of the statuette are also carved from ivory. She is depicted wearing a long robe with a crucifix on a chain around her neck. The statuette is mounted on a pedestal, moulded with four episodes from Guinevere's life. But who was Guinevere? 
Many of you, I'm sure, will already know that Guinevere is indeed the wife and queen of King Arthur in the Arthurian legend. In the later medieval romances, one of the most prominent story arcs is Queen Guinevere's tragic love affair with her husband's chief knight and friend Lancelot, indirectly causing the death of Arthur and many others and the downfall of the kingdom. She is a female figure of relative fame, but who has been portrayed as everything from a villainous and opportunistic traitor to a fatally flawed but noble and virtuous lady. She has first appeared in a publication by Geoffrey of Monmouth, a pseudo-historical chronicle of British history written in the early 12th century, and Guinevere continues to be a popular character in the modern adaptations of the legend. Nefertiti was born around 1370 BC and is perhaps best known as being a queen of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt and the great royal wife of Pharaoh Akhenaten. Nefertiti and her husband were known for a religious revolution in which they worshipped one god only, Aten or the sun disk. With her husband she reigned at what was arguably the wealthiest period of ancient Egyptian history. Some scholars believe that Nefertiti ruled briefly after her husband's death and before the accession of Tutankhamun, although this identification is a matter of ongoing debate. In Nefertiti did rule as pharaoh, her reign was marked by the fall of Amarna and relocation of the capital back to the traditional city of Thebes. Nefertiti had many titles including hereditary princess, grape of praises, lady of grace, sweet of love, Lady of the Two Lands, Main King's Wife, Great King's Wife, Lady of All Women, and Mistress of Upper and Lower Egypt. While modern Egyptological pronunciation renders her name as Nefertiti, her name was probably contemporaneously pronounced as Nefertiti. She was made famous by her bust now in Berlin's newest museum. The bust is one of the most copied works of ancient Egypt. It was attributed to the sculptor Tutmose and it was found in his workshop. Queen Nefertiti was perhaps most famous for her incredible beauty. In fact, many of the sculptures of her focus solely upon her head and shoulders, showing the detail of her face makeup and headdress. There are numerous stelae from ancient Egypt which capture the profile of Queen Nefertiti making offerings and also of her husband, Pharaoh Akhenaten and their children. This bronze figure dressed in classical dress is the goddess Spring, as depicted by the sculptor Alfred Briscoe Drury. Drury was active during the late 19th to mid 20th century and worked as a sculptor, medalist and painter, even gaining the title of Royal Academician. The goddess Spring celebrates the turning of the wheel of the year as the death and decay of winter gives way to a time of renewal and birth. Spring begins with the first green shoots and explodes into a multitude of beautiful blossoms and the promise of a good harvest. In ancient times, many festivals were held to celebrate the spring goddesses. This narrative painting depicts a group of women inmates at St James's Workhouse in Soho, London. The women are depicted seated at a table, all dressed in the same blue overalls and a white bonnet which would have been the uniform of the workhouse. One elderly lady at the top of the table is reading from a Bible. Produced by artist James Charles, to a large degree the painting contrasts significantly with what we know a workhouse to have been really like. It was painted in 1877 and is said to capture the female ward at the workhouse, showing how the women may have worshipped. Personally, this is one of my favourite paintings in the collections at Warrington Museum and Art Gallery, as I particularly like how Charles has captured the natural light filling the room and illuminating the faces and dresses of the inmates. We know that religion was an important part of workhouse life. Prayers were read to paupers before breakfast and after supper each day. Each poor law union was required to appoint a chaplain to look after the spiritual needs of the workhouse inmates and he was invariably expected to be from the established Church of England. Religious services were generally held in the dining hall, as few early workhouses had a separate chapel. In some parts of the country, there were rules that allowed inmates of other religions to leave the workhouse to attend services at their relevant churches, 
so long as they were able to provide a certificate of attendance upon their return. In 1776, there were 86 workhouses in London metropolis, plus about 12 poor farms in Hoxton and Mile End. So what was a typical day like in the workhouse for a woman? The schedule would include waking up between 5 and 6 a.m. Breakfast was between 6.30 and 7. Work between 7 and 12. Dinner between 12 and 1. Work between 1 and 6. Supper between 6 and 7. And bedtime at 8 o'clock. Sunday was a day of rest. During the winter months, inmates could wake up one hour later, starting work at 8 a.m. Another painting by the surrealist artist Sir Hubert von Herkomer captured this workhouse in London. It was titled Eventide, a scene in the Westminster Union. Similarly to Charles, Herkomer depicts a relatively sparse but warm and cosy looking workhouse, not the harsh environment that we would usually associate with these establishments. How were women treated in the workhouse? Well, workhouse life was indeed very tough. All sense of personal identity was removed from the inmates. Clothing and personal possessions were taken from them and stored, to be returned only on their discharge. After bathing, they were issued with a distinctive uniform. For women, a blue and white striped dress worn underneath a smock. Shoes were also provided. In some establishments, the category of inmate was marked out by their clothing. For example, at Bristol Incorporation Workhouse, Prostitutes were required to wear a yellow dress and a pregnant single woman a red dress. Our next female will probably be familiar with most of you and she features in one of the museum's largest artworks which can be viewed at the far end of our large art gallery. Sleeping Beauty painted by artist Edward Frederick Brutnell is one of the museum's largest oil paintings and it was purchased by the museum for the collections in 1903. Sleeping Beauty is also referred to as Princess Aurora or Briar Rose. She's the only child of King Stephen and Queen Leah. An evil fairy named Malfiant seeks revenge for not being invited to Aurora's christening and curses the newborn princess, foretelling that she will die before the sun sets on her 16th birthday by pricking her finger on the spindle of a spinning wheel. Determined to prevent this, three good fairies raise Aurora as a peasant to protect her, patiently awaiting her 16th birthday, the day the spell can only be broken by a kiss from her true love, Prince Philip. Born in London on the 13th of October 1846, the artist Frederick Brutnell was raised in Cheshire, the son of Edward Brutnell, who was headmaster of the People's College in Warrington and later editor of the Warrington Guardian. Brutnell was both a landscape and figure painter, whilst also being able to turn his hand to illustration. Whilst living in London, Brutnell studied at Lambeth School of Art. From 1868, he exhibited at the Royal Academy, the Society of British Artists and the Royal Watercolour Society. He was also a member of the Royal Society of British Artists and the Royal Institute of Oil Painters. As this painting demonstrates, Brutnell had a particular interest in folk tales and ballads. In particular, amongst his paintings are those titled Cinderella, The Frog Princess and Little Red Riding Hood. He also provided artwork for the graphic, Pall Mall magazine, The Quaver and the English Illustrated magazine. Brutnell has not received the same level of recognition as his pre-Raphaelite peers, but Sleeping Beauty has many similarities with the romantic imagery, intense colours and complexity favoured by Rossetti, Hunt and Millet. The painting shows far right the handsome prince gazing upon the sleeping princess for the first time. The princess or beauty as she is also referred to is dressed in white robes and has a ringless finger, both of which are signs of her purity. Her long hair suggests that she has been asleep for many years. Surrounding her at the castle, where she was cast under a spell, she is surrounded by thorns, brambles and tall trees, all perhaps a means of protection. The white dove nestled on the right-hand side are a potent symbol of love. One aspect of this painting which jumps out at me are the sunflowers on the prince's jacket. To the Victorians, flowers conveyed a hidden meaning in a language known as floriography or flora symbolica. The sunflowers on the jacket symbolise pure and lofty thoughts. 
The red and white roses in the top right hand corner are entwined as one and this the florographical way of conveying unity. Have you spotted in the background the old lady stumped? Is she perhaps a symbol of good or evil? Was she placed there to guard the princess to comfort her when she awoke? Or is this the wicked witch whose curse is responsible for beauty's sleep? I'm not sure whether we will ever know what the answer is to this question. We all know the fairy tale of Sleeping Beauty, the princess beauty who was cursed to sleep for 100 years by an evil fairy, only to be awakened by a kiss from a handsome prince. Some modern day feminists disparage the story, considering her passivity to be offensive, arguing for some people to stop telling the story completely. The earliest known version of the story is found in the narrative Purse of Forest, which was composed between 1330 and 1344. The version perhaps best known by modern audiences is that written by the Brothers Grimm, which was an orally transmitted version of the tale published by Perrault. The story has been chosen as a topic by many artists. We see a similar composition in the painting by Henry Maynell Ream to that of Brutnell's version of Warrant at Warrington Museum. Beauty has also been the focus of poets such as Alfred Tennyson. In recent years, there has been some attention given to the role and depiction of some leading female characters in fairy tales, particularly those portrayed by Disney. The criticism has focused primarily upon Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella, who are believed to be depicted as naive and malleable, or as delicate and vapid. As one of the largest pieces of artwork in the collections at Warrington Museum, Sleeping Beauty is so large that we would only be able to remove it from the building by taking the roof off the museum, a rather large, rather large undertaking. Our next lady also goes by the name Aurora. She is the Roman goddess of the dawn. Aurora is a deity in polytheistic religious tradition. Mater Matuta was the indigenous Latin goddess whom the Romans eventually made equivalent to Aurora and the Greek goddess Eos. The bronze sculpture of Aurora in the collections at Warrington Museum was created in 1908 by the British sculptor Edward Alfred Drury. The sculpture was accessioned into the museum's collections in 1980. As goddess of the dawn, her attributes which can be seen in the sculpture include a torch, which is a symbol of light, the eagle which hunts by day, the flowers that open with the early sun, a vessel for pouring out dew, and the morning star. Sometimes Aurora travels by chariot, and at others on feathered wings, both activities being captured within the sky as indicated by clouds. In Roman mythology, Aurora renews herself every morning and flies across the sky, announcing the arrival of the sun. Aurora appears most often in poetry with one of her mortal lovers. A myth taken from the Greek by Roman poets tells that one of her lovers was the prince of Troy, Tithonus. He was immortal and therefore would eventually age and die. But Aurora wanted to be with him for eternity and asked Jupiter to grant immortality to her lover. The wish was granted but she failed to ask for eternal youth to accompany his immortality and he became forever old. Aurora turned him into a Chicata. Dawn became, associ became associated in Roman court with Matuta, later known as Mata Matuta. She was also associated with the sea harbours and ports and had a temple on the Forum Aurorium. So we've reached the end of today's session looking at women in art at Warrington Museum and Art Gallery. I hope that you've found the session interesting and perhaps learnt something new. If you have any questions about anything mentioned in today's session, please do not hesitate to contact me. Keep an eye out on the Warrington Museum and Art Gallery website for new online sessions and content being added over the coming weeks. And we certainly hope to be able to see you at the museum soon.